Good afternoon, my fellow Panthers. My name is Jose Heeman, and I'm a trainer at uh, FIU's Talent Acquisition and Management Department, a part of the Division of Human Resources. Thank you all for joining us today to learn more about what is both an important and an emotional topic. June is Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. And according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. The number of Americans living with Alzheimer's is growing and growing fast. The National Alzheimer's Association reports that an estimated 6.2 million Americans age 65 and older are living with Alzheimer's dementia right now in 2021. And by 2050, that number may grow to a projected 12.7 million, barring the development of medical breakthroughs. And the toll taken by this disease on women, older Black Americans, and older Hispanic Americans is particularly severe. Almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. Older Black Americans are about twice as likely to have Alzheimer's or other dementias as older whites. And older Hispanics are about one and a half times as likely to have Alzheimer's or other dementias as older whites. But there are steps that we can take towards cognitive health. Research has brought to light evidence that maintaining strong social connections and keeping mentally active as we age might lower the risk of cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. And a combination of healthy lifestyle behaviors, adhering to being physically active, not smoking, light to moderate alcohol consumption, a high quality diet and cognitive activities has been linked to cognitive health. At RFIU, we are fortunate to have amazing individuals and resources that support us on our journey towards being well in so many aspects and encourage us to practice those healthy lifestyle behaviors. I'm speaking of course about the partnership between Panthers Active Wellness Services and our Office of Employee Assistance who have collaborated with the very talented Dr. Marka Gronin to bring us this event today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the director of FIU's Office of Employee Assistance, Isabel Alfonsin Vittoria. Good afternoon, Isabel. Good afternoon, Jose. Thank you for such a beautiful introduction to this very touching topic. I'm delighted to be with you all. Welcome all. Welcome Panthers, um, faculty, staff, alum, and our retiree community. This is a lovely affair. And I would like to start first by expressing gratitude, deep gratitude for the generosity of spirit of all of the partners. Um, this was an act of collaboration um, and cohesion between all of our respective areas, including the Nicole Wertheim um, College of Nursing and Health Sciences. So I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Vicki Framil, who is a visiting clinical assistant professor who had the great um, uh, idea of this collaboration between ourselves and Dr. Agronin. So thank you, Vicki, for uh, bringing ourselves uh, together and uh, including uh, Nathan Barant, the Panthers Active Wellness Services Program Manager and myself to this great opportunity. Um, the well-being uh, of our Panther family is something that is very dear and near to both PAWS um, and to the OEA. So on behalf of both of our departments, We'd like to welcome you. Um, you will be hearing from Nathan at the end of the presentation. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to tell you uh, about our esteemed guest speaker, um, who you will be hearing about shortly. Uh, Dr. Marka Gronin is the Senior Vice President of Behavioral Health and Chief Medical Officer for the MIND Institute at the Miami Jewish Home. Um, he provides a wide range of services uh, for individuals with memory changes, Alzheimer's disease, and all other neurocognitive disorders, along with associated mood and behavior disturbances. He is the driving force uh, in the development of the Miami Jewish Health Empathy Care uh, philosophy in the future Empathy Care Village. Dr. Marka Gronin has been part of the Miami Jewish Health since 1999. He is a leading expert in Alzheimer's disease and geriatric mental health issues and a nationally sought after speaker and author. So we're very, very privileged to have him with us today. 
He has written 10 books, including the critically acclaimed The End of Old Age, Living a Longer, More Purposeful Life, How We Age, A Doctor's Journey into the Heart of Growing Old, and The Dementia Caregiver, A Guide to Caring for Someone with Alzheimer's Disease and Other Neurocognitive Disorders. He's published articles in the New York Times and Scientific American Mind, and is a regular contributor on aging and retirement issues in the Wall Street Journal. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and Philosophy from Harvard University and obtained his Doctor of Medicine degree from the Yale School of Medicine. He completed his residency training in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and a fellowship in geriatric psychiatry at the VA Medical Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We are delighted to have him here today. I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Mark Agronin. Thank you so much, Dr. Agronin. Isabel, thank you so much for the very generous introduction. Thank you to you and to Jose, uh, to Nathan for helping to set this up and participating. It's, it's truly an honor for me to speak to everyone today. So I know that we have a wide range of individuals who are listening. The goal of this presentation is to be informative and practical. I really want everyone to come away from this having a much deeper understanding of what is Alzheimer's disease, what we're facing, and also what you can do to reduce your own risk. So I'll leave you with some very practical tips. And I know, uh, you know, this is something very near and dear to the work that Nathan does in terms of wellness. So we are going to end on an optimistic note without question. And my guess is there are probably questions even about this new treatment that just got approved for Alzheimer's disease. So I'm happy to answer anything at the end of the presentation. Uh, so with that, let's jump in and I'm going to uh, ask Jose to advance to the first slide. Let me just tell you very briefly about where I work and what I do. I've been at Miami Jewish Health since 1999, so for 22 years, but the institution has been around for 80 years in Miami, providing a not-for-profit center that cares for the entire range of aging individuals in our community, especially those who need rehab, who need special services. And uh, so we really are both, in terms of our residents and our staff, we represent the wide diversity of, of individuals and backgrounds and cultures that we have here in, in South Florida. And I'm really honored to be part of that tradition. My role is as the, a geriatric psychiatrist. So I oversee behavioral health on campus and throughout our system. I also started a memory disorder center and a research center and we've pioneered all of the latest and greatest studies trying to make a difference in terms of Alzheimer's disease and other conditions and so I'll be talking about that today. Uh, next slide is from our website highlighting our memory disorder center which is known as Mind Institute at Miami Jewish Health. We are one of Florida's I think 17 official memory disorder centers and so we provide a whole range of services for individuals. If you, on the next slide, I have a description of that. Individuals come to us with mild concerns to advanced stages of what we call neurocognitive disorders. So we provide a comprehensive workup, full range of mental health services, community outreach. We do a lot of work with caregivers, with families, educating, supporting them. We've just started up a new dementia prevention clinic, which is really open to anyone who wants to understand their own risk factors and what they can do about it. And you'll get a little taste of that in our program today. We've, as I mentioned, have been involved in every single major uh, clinical trial with Alzheimer's disease. And we've been involved really in the trenches uh, dealing with this and trying to find some ways to, to improve the lives of individuals. Uh, we work with a whole range of other centers in South Florida. So for instance, uh, we make referrals to the Brain Bank at Mount Sinai Medical Center for individuals who <clears throat> at the end of life if their families want to understand what really is going on in the brain, if they want to contribute to the science of it, we've worked with the brain bank as well. And finally, for individuals who 
are struggling with changes, but really want to do something positive, we started a whole brain fitness program called Meaningful Minds. And it's a wonderful program. Uh, individuals work one-on-one -on -one with our social worker here on computer games and all sorts of really great activities. We've switched everything to telehealth during COVID, but we're going back to doing more things in person. If you have any questions, any needs, feel free to call our hotline. I put it right there. It's 305 514 8710. And we have a study assistant here who will answer. She'll get all your information. She'll route the question to whoever on our team uh, can get back to you. And uh, really just want to be a resource for whatever you need. So next slide. What are we going to talk about today? I'm going to begin by defining this term dementia. What is it? What does it mean? What are the different types? Uh, what are the risk factors? We know that lots of people have this, but what can you do to try to prevent it? That's becoming really the name of the game as, as we look into the future. Let's talk practically about how we diagnose it. How do we treat it? And I'm gonna focus on what makes sense, what there's scientific evidence for, as opposed to lots of the myths about that. And finally, I'm gonna bring you I'm going to give you a ringside seat to what is new. What's the latest in terms of our understanding of the disease, in terms of treatment? What's this new treatment that came on the market? I can tell you anything you need to know about it. I'll summarize it, but I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. So I'd like to begin not talking about what goes wrong in the brain, but let's talk about what goes right. So we know that with time, our brains continue to develop. We tend to think about development in terms of children, but let's also think about development in terms of as adults, because with time, we gain more experiences, we learn, and we build up in our brain what we call our brain reserve and our cognitive reserve. And basically, our brain reserve refers to just all the number of cell, brain cells and all the connections they have with one another. Our cognitive reserve refers to all the skills, experiences, our general intelligence. So when you put these two together, it's the totality of what our brain is and what our brain does and is capable of doing. And the more you build this up over time and continue to build up throughout your life, as you can see, I, my image is it's like putting money in the bank because then with age, when things change, when they slow down, if you have some sort of injury, this is your insurance, this gives you a buffer. And this has a lot to do with explaining why certain people do better or worse uh, later in life when they're faced with changes in their brain structure or function. And what we try to do in our whole process is to understand the totality of that. We are not about just looking at what goes wrong. We have to also look at what goes right. And as we go through the talk, I'm, that's gonna be a big focus. That's what I do a lot of writing about. When I write about aging, I'm focused on what are our strengths because that's really what carries the day in the end. So just an example, the older brain, we tend to think about it in terms of disease and decline and decrepitude, but I wanna remind everyone that the older brain has some unique strengths. One is what we call neuroplasticity. It can grow, it can adapt over time. Our brains are constantly adapting and re-sculpting themselves. And they do that in some unique ways that actually become stronger with age. Older brains are better at recruiting a variety of different brain circuits. Older brains better utilize both sides of the brain. If we were sitting in a lecture hall, I would, I would look out amongst the, the whole lecture hall and I would say, if you were a young brain and I put a math problem on the board, I'm gonna to point to one of you, maybe two of you in the audience and ask you to solve it. That's a young brain. With the older brain, I'm gonna pick maybe three, four people on the left side of the room and five or six people on the right side of the room. And I'm gonna tell you to get together and discuss and come up with a solution to this. I think we know which group has more experience, more uh, ability to really bring different perspectives on it. It's the older brain. So we have to stop thinking of ourselves and our brains as we get older, just from uh, the standpoint of something in decline. We have to realize we have strengths and we really focus on that regardless of what's going on with someone and we leverage those strengths. Next slide. So that's what works right, what, what we gain. What about what changes over time. Uh, 
And so I, I call this the downside of brain aging because basically our brain cells, our neurons face three different changes. First of all, as I write here, they get dirty. What do I mean by that? Over time, your cells build up a lot of gunk. Picture it like your house. If, if you don't do a lot of maintenance, even with maintenance over time, you build up dust and grime and dirt and it becomes more and more difficult to clean that out. Think of your brain cells the same way. With time, it, they're, they're use, you, use, uh, using energy, they're doing lots of things, they build up lots of gunk and it's more difficult to get rid of it. And so as a result, they simply do less. They don't produce as many neurotransmitters, these chemicals that help our brains communicate. They don't transport materials or signals as quickly, as efficiently. They're, they don't produce as much energy. And we know that in general, neurons die as we get older. To some extent, we can grow new brain cells. It's not true that as some people say, if it's it, once your brain cells goes, you don't get any more. That's, that's not entirely true, but atrophy is the rule. So any older brain is going to be more wrinkly, more shriveled, smaller in volume than a younger brain. But to some extent, it's not about the volume per se. It's really about connections. And our brains are always able to make more connections. And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk about how we can really boost that process. Because, and I think this is a wonderful rule in life, it's all about the connections you make. Next slide. If you measure over time your cognitive abilities, things like your memory, how quickly you can process different thoughts or problem solving, your spatial orientation, your ability to, to solve math problems, to come up with words. What we see over time is that these skills do slow down and decline. This uh, slide shows data from the Seattle Longitudinal Study in Aging. And in essence, what they did is they looked at groups of individuals in every decade. So they would do the same tests on 30 year olds and 40 year olds and all the way up through 80 year olds. And what they found is in general, these intellectual skills tend to peak in our 30s through 60s. Uh, it's, it's variable, but that's in, in general the rule. But there are moderate declines in our 60s and 70s and more severe declines in our 80s. And so in essence, what this is saying is that the, the speed and the efficiency at which you are able to solve, let's say, a math problem or a word problem when you're 30 and 40 will be, will be faster and more efficient than when you're 80. So some people look at this and they think, well, this is, this is aging in essence. We know these changes occur with time. We all tend to have more of these tip of the tongue experiences or memory lapses as we get older. We tend to assume that everything is in decline, that this is the story of aging. Inevitably, this does happen. We can't run as fast when we're 80 as when we're 30 or 40. You can train your body and do a lot, but the fastest 80 year old will never run as fast as the fastest 30 year old. We know that although there are many 80 year olds who can run faster than most of us. And that's also true. Uh, but the point being that those are, if you only measure your, your value or your worth on these paper and pencil cognitive tests, it might, might lead you to look at aging in, in somewhat of a negative and pessimistic way. But I wanna remind you, this is not the topic of our talk. I write about this in some of the books I'll highlight, but I wanna remind you that there are certain things that do increase, improve, and strengthen with age, like experience and wisdom and creativity, uh, resilience. And these factors make all the difference. And so many people will say, well, my memory is not as strong when I'm 70 or 80, but my problem solving is better, or I, ha I have deeper, more meaningful experiences as I, get, as I get older. So we need to stop looking at the brain from just in ourselves from a negative perspective. How is this relevant to the talk? I'll show you very shortly. It's very, very relevant to our risk factors for dementia, how we cope with that, how we work as caregivers. Next slide. So undeniably some people as they get older, the changes in their memory or their cognition are not normal. Normal changes would be more greater frequency of memory lapses here or there, Maybe it takes a little bit longer to a, to, for a memory, a face, a name to come to us. That's normal. Uh, and as long as it's not happening too frequently or really interfering with our day significantly, that's normal. But we do need to be very cognizant of the fact that sometimes things are more than normal or, or worse than normal. Some people develop what we call mild cognitive impairment or MCI, or we have a new term we call it a mild neurocognitive disorder. And it's basically defined by the following. It's noticeable, so people will subjectively say, yeah, I, I have memory complaints or I have changes in other domains in, in terms of my brain. 
If we do specialized testing, the scores will be a little lower than the average for someone of that age, usually about, a, you know, not more than a standard deviation, but in the range of one standard deviation lower. So objectively, there is evidence of some decline. But at the end of the day, daily function is essentially normal. This is critical. If someone is having more frequent and more significant cognitive lapses and it's interfering with their daily function, this would go above and beyond what we consider mild cognitive impairment. And that's what we'll talk about in a minute. The reason why it's so important to recognize MCI is because it's a window into the future. And we know that in general, a third, roughly a third of individuals are, remain relatively stable. Whatever caused the changes doesn't necessarily get better, if, especially if they don't do anything about it, but they're relatively the same. A third get better. And so whatever was causing it was reversible, but a third go on to develop dementia. And this number increases as we get older. And this is if you follow people over two to three years. And let's, so let's talk about what we mean by that term dementia, because it's really important. Next slide. And one more click. So the term dementia comes from Latin. It literally means dementia, without a mind or without a brain. The term was used back in ancient Rome. In fact, it was not a kind term to be called. People didn't routinely live into their 70s or 80s, so it wasn't necessarily a medical term, but it was used in some of the ways we still use it today to put people down, to insult them, to say they're out of control, they're crazy. If you were uh, arguing with your, with your adversary in the Roman Senate, you might refer to him, him as demented. Uh, so it's not a nice term, which is why we are getting away from the term. And the new term that the American Psychiatric Association adopted in 2013 is major neurocognitive disorder. So we're really trying to push away the term dementia, in part because of its negative connotations, but in part because it's not as descriptive as major neurocognitive disorder. Um, I'll use the terms interchangeably in the talk today. But its definition is very simple. It's a brain disease in which you have impairment in one or more of your essential cognitive domains. And what are those essential cognitive domains listed here? One is complex attention, how well you're able to multitask and focus on different things at different times and prioritize. Then there's executive function, your ability to plan, to organize, to prioritize. That's largely accomplished in the frontal lobes of your brain. How well you learn and memorize things. And this uh, is centered throughout your brain, but mostly in, in a sense, something called the hippocampus, which is right in the center of your brain, right near your, the inner regions of your temporal lobes, which are right running along the sides of your head. Um, then there is the domain of perceptual motor skills, your ability to perceive, see things, recognize them, and also move throughout space using maps, using items, manipulating things. So that's our, really our, our function. Uh, then there's language both be able to communicate and understand and coordinate the two together. And finally, the domain of social cognition. This is our ability to really act appropriately, to uh, regulate our behaviors, to self-regulate, and to know how to adapt to certain circumstances. So you can see that when we say someone has a dementia or a major neurocognitive disorder, in essence, what we're saying is that in one or more of these different domains, there has been change leading to impairment. So. It's, it's a wide or broad diagnosis. There are many different forms of dementia. Next slide. And we'll talk about those in a minute. But we need to understand that this is a growing epidemic. If we just look at the major subtype or the most common form of dementia, which is Alzheimer's disease, it is growing exponentially. Right now, nearly 6 million Americans are, are living with it. This will, this will over more than double by 2050. There are 50 million individuals in the world of very forms of dementia. This is going to triple by 2050. If we look at Florida alone, we have 580,000 individuals. This is just in Florida who have Alzheimer's disease. This has increased by nearly 15% in the last four years. This is the second highest prevalence in the United States. And as we've been recognizing the involvement of Alzheimer's disease in terms of people's demise, the recording of deaths due to Alzheimer's disease has increased by 145% since 2000. Now this is due in part to greater recognition, but it's also due to the fact that there are many, many, many more people living into their 80s and 90s, which is the highest risk zone 
for Alzheimer's disease and for other forms of dementia for that matter. And it is the single most expensive disease in the country costing almost $300 billion a year, more expensive than heart disease, more expensive than cancer, and yet we spend a fraction of research dollars for Alzheimer's disease compared to heart disease and cancer. I wouldn't take a penny away from research for heart disease and cancer. In fact, I put more there, but we need to put more for Alzheimer's disease as well. Next slide. So if we say that someone has dementia or a major neurocognitive disorder, it's a little like saying someone has an infection. If you go to the doctor and, he, and you say, well, you have, he or she says you have an infection, your question obviously is gonna be, well, what type of infection do I have? Is it a pneumonia, is it respiratory? You know, you might have some idea, but we need to think about the term dementia the same way. If you have some sort of injury or damage to your brain that's causing cognitive decline or impairment, the question is, what type or what form of dementia is this? The most common is Alzheimer's disease. We'll talk about that. That represents 60 to 70% of all cases. Second to that, <coughs> excuse me, is dementia due to stroke or bleed in the brain, what we call vascular dementia, and that's 15 to 20 percent, and th there can be overlap. You can have both Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. We call this a mixed dementia. Some people have a subtype called dementia Lewy body disease, maybe 10 to 15 percent, and that has a specific symptomatic profile. You can have dementia from Parkinson's disease. Less common, but really devastating forms of dementia fall under the category of frontotemporal dementia. Some of these affect behavior, others affect more language, some both. We tend to see these more in younger individuals in their 40s and 50s, but not, thank God, not as common, but, but really devastating diseases. And then finally, people have dementia due to medical causes, to trauma, toxic exposure, illnesses, things like that. So, um, if someone goes to get a diagnosis of dementia, the question is we want to know to the best of our ability is what type do they have? Because that's going to shape our understanding of the course and the treatment. So next slide. So what is Alzheimer's disease? It's a progressive dementia that involves the upper cortical or cortex of the brain. It typically begins with short-term memory complaints because it begins in the hippocampus or your memory processing center of the brain, but it progresses over on average eight to 12 years to involve every cognitive domain. So with that, it's going to impact function, mood, behavior control. We have treatments that can modify symptoms. We're just on the cusp with this new medication of something that can modify the disease course itself. And we'll talk about that. And you can see, I, I put this little graph down there to illustrate that if the whole pie, it represents dementia, the, the certainly the biggest slice of it is Alzheimer's disease. So everyone with Alzheimer's disease has dementia, not everyone with dementia has Alzheimer's disease. So it's important to, to keep that in mind. Next slide. Let's take a little walk through history. Where does this even come from? So there are descriptions of Alzheimer's disease or not called that, but descriptions of people with cognitive impairment going all the way back to ancient history. You can find descriptions of this even in the Bible. Um, and certainly if you look at, at uh, Greek and Roman historical accounts and medical accounts, this is well recognized. Uh, but usually back then people, if they had dementia, it was due to injury to the brain, usually, or vas as it got older, vascular damage. No one treated high blood pressure or, or diabetes back in ancient Rome, or for that matter, up until this past century. And so people would have damage to the blood supply and blood vessels to their brain. And that typically is what caused at much earlier ages, dementia. As, as the, the lifespan began to change and grow, um, we began to see emerging what Alois Alzheimer's saw, and actually in somewhat of a younger patient in 1901, he called it a peculiar, di peculiar disease of the cerebral cortex. And he worked at, you can see in this photo, this large, uh, beautiful Gothic uh, psychiatric hospital in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, click the next build. And he had this woman, a uh, 51-year-old 50 year woman named Auguste D, who came to see him, who actually began becoming very suspicious of her husband. She was developed paranoid ideation. And over time, she became, um, you know, more and more impaired. And back then, 
you, we didn't have brain scans. You know, the only way for doctors to really understand what was going on with someone is you actually had to do a postmortem. And so next slide. When she passed away, this is a photograph of Alois Alzheimer's actual laboratory. So he removed her brain, next, next click, uh, and took notes on what he saw. That's a copy of his actual notes. Next slide, or next click. Uh, that's just a representative uh, illustration, but he took out her brain, next. Um, and he did what, and one more click. Perfect. Well, he did what people at the time were just starting to do. There were microscopes back in 1901, but you know, if you took a tissue and you put it under a microscope, it's hard to, to visualize a lot. And so what a number of physicians and neurologists developed at the time is different type of stains, almost like inks that if they treated the tissue with, they would highlight certain things. And so what Alois Alzheimer's did was he made some thin slides of sections of her brain, he put on some of these new stains and two things emerged that he described for the first time in history, which is why the disease ended up being named after him. First of all, he noticed that outside of brain cells, there were these clumps of protein. He called these, these plaques. You can see in the top slide, those little black clumps, which do not, you, typically in an older brain, you'll see a few of them scattered here and there, but in this case, the brain was riddled with them and they were destroying the brain cells around them. So he knew that was not good. And then he also noted when you looked at it in very closely inside brain cells, many of them had collapsed because they had what looked like a tangle of hairs in them. You know, you think about what you see at the, at the, at the bottom of, of your drain, uh, if, you're, if you're not <laughs> cleaning out your shower, uh, literally these clumps that looked like hair and he called these tangles. To this day, the only way to make a 100% certain diagnosis of this disease is you have to take brain tissue, put the same stains on it, and look for plaques and tangles that are all throughout the brain. And we know that these begin in the inner part of the brain in your memory center, which is why short-term memory is one of the first symptoms. And they slow, we don't know exactly how or why, but they, but they spread slowly but steadily throughout the entire cortex of the brain. And so the question we've had all along is, well, if, if, are, if are plaques and tangles really the culprit here? We learned that the plaques are made up of a, of a protein called beta amyloid, which is insoluble. So it's, it's almost like a hard crust that builds up in the brain. We also know that the tangles are composed of a different protein called tau. It's, it's a normal protein in your brain, but, but tau gets destabilized um, and, and, and it clumps together inside. So a normal amyloid and tau protein in the brain become these toxic monsters in the brain. They form plaques and tangles. And then we begin to see over time, slowly but steadily as they build up the brain, the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So the question people say is, well, boy, is that the cause of Alzheimer's? If we just get rid of plaques and tangles, will that, will that cure it? Will that stop it? So we're gonna come to that very shortly in terms of what's going on uh, right now. Uh, next slide. So before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what are the risk factors? Why do people get Alzheimer's disease? And, and is there anything we can do to stop it or slow it down? Next slide. Um, so let's divide this into early life, midlife, and late life. And, and uh, these are based on guidelines, not only from the, the United States National Institutes of Health, but also from the National Institute of Health uh, and Care Excellence in the United Kingdom. So Early in life, we know that there are two major risk factors. One are your genetics and that you can't control that obviously. And we'll talk about those in a minute. We also know that individuals who get higher education early in life, that's somewhat protective. Um, so the more that you build your brain reserve when you're younger through education, through rich experiences, that tends to be somewhat protective and reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease. So that can be modified. The major risk factors that emerge in midlife are hearing loss. That's interesting. This has been really a big topic lately that people with hearing loss, especially if they don't do anything to correct it, at our, at our significantly increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, probably because you're just not stimulating the brain as much. Uh, hypertension, or high blood pressure, big risk factor. Anything that damages the heart, like high blood pressure, that damages your small blood vessels in your brain are going to damage brain tissue. And obesity is a risk factor. And, and probably because it's linked to uh, one of the main late life risk factors, which is diabetes. Um, diabetes, in fact, is probably one of the most potent risk factors, not only for vascular dementia, but also for Alzheimer's disease. Other late life risk factors, smoking, untreated depression, 
physical inactivity and social isolation. I think what we're seeing is that about, you know, about a third of these risk factors we can potentially modify to make a difference. But, you know, your genetics and some other factors are more difficult to modify. I think what you're saying is that anything that's damaging or bad for your heart and is bad and damaging for your brain is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So indeed, there is a lot people can do. But I would tell you, I've worked with individuals who are triathletes and who have none of these risk factors and they still get Alzheimer's disease. So in, in those cases, genetics really carry the day. Next slide. And when we think about genetics, we, we divide it into two different categories, early onset and late onset. Most people have late onset, 90 to 95% of cases occur after the age of 90, 65. And you can see there are lots of different risk factors on lots of different chromosomes um, for this. Uh, alcohol, if someone asked about alcohol abuse, um, you know, it's interesting. To some extent, people who drink a lot are at higher risk for vascular dementia, for stroke. Um, to some extent, heavy use of alcohol has a bit of a blood thinning property. And so, you know, you might be at more of a risk for a hemorrhagic stroke, but it's not necessarily a risk for Alzheimer's disease. I think it's, it's a risk when it goes along with other health problems. So if your drinking is causing blood pressure problems, glucose problems, increased risk of injury, your, your risk for dementia is higher, but not necessarily for Alzheimer's disease. So that's a good question. Um, and there are families that have genet uh, genetic mutations on chromosomes one, 14, one and 14 that, that tend to build up more beta amyloid and, and are at a high risk for getting Alzheimer's disease. So it's a whole separate discussion, but just to tell you that we do have a good genetic understanding of it. Um, next slide. In particular, there's on chromosome 19, something called the apolipoprotein epsilon or ApoE gene. Um, if you have what's called ApoE4, that four genetic factor, especially if you have one copy from a parent, it increases your risk and lowers the age of onset. If you have two copies, it increases your risk at least fivefold. Um, APOE2 decreases your risk. APOE3, which is what most people have, is more neutral. We don't routinely test for this because let's say I let's say you're 40 and I determine that you have APOE4, so you're at a higher risk. There's really nothing you can do about it. What I'm going to tell you at the end, this the brain healthy lifestyle everyone should be doing. Next slide. Um, it's important not to delay assessment because a lot of people have reversible causes. Uh, the longer you wait, we can't, the treatment doesn't work as well. We can't get you involved in research. You're exposing yourself to hazardous situations. Um, and, it's, and it's bad if you don't know what's going on and people have anxiety because of it. They have all sorts of problems. Sometimes they get misdirected to, to different uh, treatments that don't work or that are inappropriate or unsafe. And sometimes, guess what? You don't have dementia. There's some other condition that now you're not treated. So I've treating. I've seen people who have chronic depression and bipolar disorder and attention deficit disorder that's causing what is believed to be Alzheimer's disease or some form of dementia, but it hasn't been diagnosed. So they're not getting appropriate treatment. And that's one of the strengths at our memory center because coming from a psychiatric perspective, I can uh, identify and, and, and diagnose and treat all those other conditions. So we want people in early, next slide to get a comprehensive evaluation. What that involves is a thorough uh, history of their what's going on, what are the symptoms, um, and what we call a mental status examination. I wanna know how well they're thinking, what their mood is like, how their mental processing is, how do they express themselves, how do they describe themselves? That's what we call mental status examination. Um, and we do a cognitive screen. We do a brief test to see how their memory is, just to get a, a, a sense for it. Um, we do a physical and neurologic examination. We do basic labs. Usually not, not, the labs are not going to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. They're going to identify other factors that may be causing or worsening the situation. So, you know, I've never had someone come in and they have such severe thyroid dysfunction that that's causing their cognitive impairment. But I certainly have seen people who have Alzheimer's disease and they're doing worse because they're either too high or too low on their thyroid hormone or they're very anemic or something like that. You know, occasionally I'll see, you know, we see a young person who just doesn't fit the profile. And then we, then we do a workup. We look for, you know, for Lyme disease. We look at infection in their spinal fluid. CSF stands for cerebrospinal fluid. But that tends to be the exception, not the rule. We always want to get a brain scan. Um, 
if someone has Alzheimer's disease that runs in the family, um, this is what we're working on now with our prevention clinic. Um, you know, when you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, unless you have a strong family history, people get it in their 40s and 50s. Now, that's a different story. Then you need to be detected early. But typically, um, you know, if someone is having memory issues in their 40s and 50s, it's usually not a form of dementia. It's they're not sleeping well. They're, you know, taking a certain medication or whatnot. It's never too early to talk to your doctor about memory or other cognitive changes. Um, but I usually tell people, you know, unless you're really noticing uh, more significant changes, you know, we don't really have a, at least at this point, a standard approach um, when you're at that age until you get into say your sixties and seventies and you notice more and then we can make a difference. So, um, and people often don't recognize their symptoms. So what do you do in that case? Well, um, that's a challenge. I usually have people start with their doctor and, and uh, you know, have a loved one tell the doctor, you know, I'm worried about their, their memory a little bit. And the doctor can do some basic lab work. Start with that. Uh, your primary care physician, if they're concerned, they can always do a brain scan to make sure there's nothing going on. But everyone has to get a brain scan. That's really critical. Uh, there's other scanning that we do. And if we're really concerned, we, we do neuropsychological testing. It's basically IQ testing. And that will give us objectively if there's any evidence of anything. But what I emphasize is sooner or later, get to an expert. And there's several reasons for this. One, because you want someone who knows the landscape and what they, you know, what it's going on with it. And I encourage people, you know, you go to a memory center, go to a neurologist who specializes in this, a geriatric psychiatrist, but make sure that they specialize in this. You know, if you were having chest pain, you're not going to walk down the street and go to your podiatrist. And honestly, most even primary care physicians are going to send you right away to a cardiologist. But too often I see people have cognitive changes and they simply don't go to a specialist. And a lot of the primary care doctors struggle to really know what's going on. And so they don't end up getting a really solid diagnosis. I would tell you my approach, I'm really conservative with diagnosis. I have a completely open mind, open slate when people come in. So I, I to me, it's like putting together a puzzle. I get, I gather all this data. I present it to the individual and the family. We talk about what are the possibilities and what do we need to do to hone that. And then we also focus on positive approaches. So um, that's just the pledge you have from us. You're not going to walk in and we're not going to put a stamp down and say, this is, you know, this is the, the diagnosis end all be all. No, we really want to understand both what's going wrong, but also what's going right. Next slide. And in terms of the scanning, um, we do either a CAT scan or an MRI. Now, MRI is going to be the ideal way to look at what's going on in the brain. It will identify strokes, bleeds, tiny changes in the circuitry of the brain, tiny strokes that you're not going to really see on a CAT scan. MRI doesn't have radiation like a CAT scan, but there are individuals who have paced certain pacemakers and other metal in their body that can't have an MRI. In that case, we do a CT scan. But in general, everyone has to have an MRI. And the older you get, I want to make sure there's not something going on that is causing the issues. Um, you're not going to diagnose Alzheimer's disease based on the MRI. You're going to rule out other causes. Because remember, to visualize those plaques and tangles, you have to either take a piece of brain tissue out of the brain and put the stains on it to look for it on the microscope. Or what we can do now is in essence, we, in, we give someone an injection of these dyes with some radioactivity attached to it. It sticks to these proteins in the brain and we basically light it up on a PET scan machine. So these are new type of scans we have looking for amyloid, which are on the market now looking for tau, which we use experimentally. But that's a new approach. The problem is that insurance, don't, insurance companies do not pay for these scans. They cost $3,000 each. And so they're not practical to do. We can do a spinal tap and look at your spinal fluid and we look for certain levels of amyloid and tau. Um, and, but you know, most people are not rushing to get a spinal tap. Uh, finally, what we do is we can also do a PET scan that looks at function. So what do I mean by that? We basically give people, I, I like to call it radioactive Kool-Aid. You give someone a radioactive glucose solution. It goes into their brain and the parts of the brain that are working normally are using normal levels of glucose, which light up on the scan. Uh, if their brain or sections are not working well, they don't. So if you look at those representative scans, um, look at the one that says AD or Alzheimer's disease, the areas in yellow and red, that's normal functioning brain tissue. And you can see um, towards the bottom on both sides, there's areas that are more blue and green. They're just simply not working as well. 
Those are your parietal lobes of your brain, very characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. The brain next to it has a frontotemporal dimension. So the top part, which is the frontal part of the brain, you can see has kind of gone silent. Um, and so that's, you know, that's more selective parts of the brain not working. So we have all these different scans we can do, but again, you have to really know what you're doing, what you're looking for, and how you integrate this information together. Next slide. So we're in a new era in terms of understanding and treating Alzheimer's disease. What we understand now is that the day someone walks into a doctor's office complaining of cognitive changes is not the day Alzheimer's began. In fact, it's not the week, it's not the year Alzheimer's disease began. You're probably 10, 15, 20 years already down the river with that. And that's the main concern. How do we detect it early? Well, we use what are called biomarkers. A biomarker is a physical measurable entity that, that gives you evidence of having a certain disease. So for instance, a biomarker for diabetes would be a blood glucose level or your hemoglobin A1C. So in the last 10 years, we developed biomarkers that allow us to see, is there the likely presence of Alzheimer's disease? So what are these biomarkers? Well, we look for beta amyloid protein. We can see it in spinal fluid. We can see it on amyloid-based PET scans that we talked about. We look for tau protein. Again, we can see it in cerebrospinal fluid. We can see it in now a new experimental tau-based PET scans. We also look for loss of energy, loss of metabolism in the brain, as we saw on the previous scan, using a, um, a glucose-oriented PET scan. And finally, what we do see in MRIs is we see a lot of shrinkage, especially if you see disproportionate shrinkage in the hippocampus of the brain, which is those on each side of your brain you have, it's your memory processing center. You know, that tells us that it may be Alzheimer's disease. So now we can put all these different findings together without actually having to take a piece of brain tissue out, which is not a desirable test to do. And it can give us a better indication of whether this is Alzheimer's disease. But you can see this is, this is a big process to do, and you really need someone who knows what they're doing. Next slide. So this slide is the most important slide I'm going to show you today. It's very complicated, but I'm going to walk you through it to really have you understand the essence of this disease. And the essence is that it starts early before you get symptoms and progresses over time. And someone had a question, what if your family has history of Parkinson's disease? Um, typically in Parkinson's disease, you're going to see motor changes first. So you know, someone is moving slower movements or, um, you know, this, the, the shaking you can get in a person's hands or in different parts of their body. Not everyone with Parkinson's disease develops cognitive impairment or dementia, and that usually comes later. So with Parkinson's disease, especially if, you know, if it, you know, it can run in your family or not, but, you know, we don't always see that, but the neurologist is going to pick up changes in terms of how you move based on an exam. So I'm going to take you through the progression of Alzheimer's disease from someone pre-symptomatic. And so this is usually maybe 15 or 20 years before they actually have symptoms. So this may be in someone's 40s and 50s into early mild cognitive impairment. So just starting to see some mild changes, late mild cognitive impairment. So there's definite noticing of cognitive changes into then full-blown dementia. So first click. This represents the buildup of beta amyloid in the brain. And what it's showing is that throughout the 5, 10, 15 years that you don't have any symptoms, your brain is building up beta amyloid throughout it. That's a frightening prospect because what it's telling us, it's kind of like you sitting in your living room and a fire starts in a different room of the house and you're oblivious to the fact that most of your house is on fire because it hasn't come into the living room yet. And by the time you open the door and see flames, half the house is burnt down. This is the problem with Alzheimer's disease. And this is why we're struggling so much with any of the treatments because it's almost like too little too late. Even if you put that fire out, um, half the house is already destroyed. And so if your brain is already riddled with beta amyloid protein, even if you get rid of it, it's already taken a toll. And, and you can't reverse that in your brain like you could maybe reverse it in your liver or a different part of your body. Next click. And so if we use amyloid imaging, we can actually pick it up much earlier. So that's the advantage, but we're not going to, we're not going to take this expensive PET scan and do it on every 40 year old. Theoretically, you could begin to pick it up early, but um, even with that, the question is, what are you going to do? This may be the future. 
that maybe just like you get a colonoscopy at age 50, you're going to get in, go in and get an amyloid PET scan or an amyloid blood test. And if it's high, then you're going to get treatment to get rid of it. So that may be the future. We're not quite there. Next click. Tau protein begins in blue, begins to build up later and at a slower level, but you can still see it almost peaks before you even have a diagnosis of dementia. And, and there, there's a relationship between amyloid and tau. And you can see if you're measuring metabolic changes in the orange or looking at the MRI and seeing shrinkage in your hippocampus, you can see that these changes are happening slowly but steadily. But again, what I want you to see in this in the next click, which is looking at cognitive and functional changes, these all come much later. So you already have buildup of amyloid, buildup of tau, loss of metabolism, shrinkage of your hippocampus. This is all going on year after year after year until finally there's, you reach a tipping point where you begin to see cognitive and functional changes. So this is why early diagnosis is key and we need ways to intervene early. Next slide. So what, what are we going to do to treat this? And, and this is really critical. If we do nothing with Alzheimer's disease, it continues to progress. Next click. If we put you on one of the four FDA approved cognitive enhancing medications that we'll talk about in a minute, either the cholinesterase, cholinesterase inhibitors like Aricept, Exelon, and Razadine, or Memantine, which is a different type of medication, we can improve symptoms modestly, but we don't slow the course of the disease down. Next click. If we use this new medication, aducanumab on the market or similar immunotherapeutics that we're studying or research, we wanna slow the course of the disease down and that's the goal. But you can see it's not a cure, it's just slowing it down. You're not getting better. Next click. The goal is to stop it in its tracks, to cure it right away early before you get any cognitive or functional decline. So that's, that's our goals. We're not quite, we're just starting to get into the orange. We're not at the, at the red at this point. Next slide. Um, there is no magic formula. All these potions and brain tonics that people get, there's no evidence that any of them work. I'm just gonna state that and I will state that a thousand times uh, to the extent that some of them like ginkgo have been researched, they have not shown to have any significant benefit for Alzheimer's disease or for dementia for that matter. Yes, there are always gonna be these little studies and people making claims and theoretically, you know, people can give you all sorts of theoretical reasons why, you know, this works and that works. But I'm telling you at the end of the day, I'm not gonna have you spend hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars on something like pomegranate extract or, or you know, uh, jellyfish extract that has no data does anything for you. So, um, you know, look, if these work so well, we would know about it, believe you me. Next slide. And by that same token, and I just did a whole review paper on, on THC from cannabis on CBD oil, a lot of big fantasies people have. It's a big business now, but if you get right down to it, there is no solid evidence that they help with Alzheimer's disease. There's no solid evidence they help with cognition. Um, and they can have negative effects. So I know you, you talk to people who claim that CBD oil has done everything, you know, including, uh, you know, resolve their marital relationship. I'm telling you, the evidence is very early. It's few and far between. This is a big business. And so people are going to make wild claims. Um, I work with the, some of the leading cannabis researchers in the country. And believe you me, no one and they know the research is pushing to use this at this point. I would tell you that CBD oil is relatively benign, but you know, why are you gonna spend all this money on something that's not gonna work? It does have a placebo effect. Um, coconut oil, um, we know that coconut oil and there was a medication on the, on the market. It wasn't a medication, but like a, called a medical food. Basically what coconut oil is, it's a, it's a fatty acid. And if you eat a lot of fatty acids, so if you're drinking like a jug, and I, I, I'm serious about that, a jug of coconut oil day, your body is gonna turn it into ketones. And those ketones are gonna go into your brain. And someone, there's a belief that theoretically ketones, if your brain is not taking up glucose well, which we know happens in Alzheimer's disease, ketones is another form of, of fuel that can help. Uh, but we've done major studies with this and has not borne out. So again, I think it's more placebo effect than anything. Um, I don't think there's harm to it unless you're drinking a lot of coconut oil. It's probably not the best for your heart, but in general, there's no good evidence to support this. Next slide. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we wanna both 
improve symptoms. Um, the existing medications in the market can do that modestly, but they don't slow it down. There's not a lot of things we're studying now, including this new aducanumab, to see if it can slow down the course of the disease by getting rid of amyloid or tau or blunting its impact on the brain. Um, but it's, it's very modest. So next slide. I'm not going to go into the details. These are the medications FDA approved on the market. We usually get someone on an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, and then we add memantine to it over time. That combination seems to do the best. But next slide. These can have side effects. The cholinesterase inhibitors can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite, dizziness. Um, so we just have to be cautious with those. Memantine is pretty benign. Some people get a little sedated, even a little fuzzy on it that gets better. Um, the bottom line is that um, these cognitive enhancing medications um, have significant evidence that they help, but even with that, it's modest. Um, all this other stuff people are taking doesn't even have that level of evidence. Um, so just because something is perceived as, as, as more natural doesn't mean it does anything for you. Uh, next slide. So what about aduhelm or aducanumab? So we've studied this at our institute since the very beginning. So I, I have, I think, more, more experience with this than, than most people out there because we've worked at it for many years. Basically, what it does is an antibody that when you give someone an infusion, it sticks to amyloid plaque in your brain and your immune cells in your brain eat it up and get rid of it. And we know over time, people on it, um, it, it you can watch the amyloid clearing from their brain. The problem is that when they did studies with it, they didn't really find, they certainly didn't find any improvement in cognition. What they found over time is that in one of the studies, the group of individuals on the highest dose of this showed um, some slowing in terms of their decline. So it's, it's, it's like this, it's like I, you're speeding down the highway and I, I put something in your car that slows you from 90 miles an hour to 70 miles an hour it's a significant slowing, but the question is, what does that really mean? Um, you know, you're, you're still gonna hit a wall at a certain point. So it's very controversial because a lot of clinicians are questioning, is the impact of it significant enough to be on the market or not? Um, and there's ongoing studies and the company freely admits that, that we need to keep on studying this. And the FDA says, we will see what the data looks like over time. So, uh, you know, it's only for people with early stage symptoms. You have to show evidence of amyloid in your brain, either through a brain scan, an amyloid scan, or a spinal tap. It's unclear, um, you know, uh, whether insurance are going to pay for that. It's very expensive. We don't know if insurance is going to pay for it. So it's a lot of questions out there. Um, we're doing, we're studying this in research and similar things like that. Um, and uh, someone asked a question about diet and dark chocolate, blueberries, salmon. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, next slide. And I'm going to, I talked about this. Let me skip. Next slide. Just keep in mind that on these treatments, they're well tolerated. But what people can see over time, and this is why you have to have a baseline MRI and an MRI at seven and 12 months, some people can get um, some edema or fluid buildup in the brain. Some people can get these tiny, what they're called microhemorrhages, like a mini, a teeny tiny stroke. Typically, we don't even know they're there. We only see them when we do an MRI. That's why they're called amyloid-related imaging abnormalities because usually someone doesn't even know it's there. I, we've, we've seen this quite a bit when we've done in our research studies. And typically what we do, um, next click, usually is asymptomatic. Some people can get headache, dizziness, confusion. Uh, next click. Um, people with ApoE4 are at higher risk for it. And uh, next click, they typically resolve over time. So to, what we do is we just hold the, hold the infusion until we see it goes away and then we can restart it. That's typically what we do. Um, next slide. Um, I know we're gonna go over about five minutes. So I apologize if someone uh, has to go, um, but I promise I'm gonna wrap this up in five minutes. What's new in Alzheimer's disease? Um, there's a new blood test out. We look for tau in, in blood. Uh, we're looking at it in clinical trials. So far, I've had a number of people had a positive tau blood test and their tau scan was positive. I had someone at a po positive tau test and their tau scan was negative. So um, that's why I, there's not a single test that's going to say 100% you have Alzheimer's disease, but it gives us more of an indication. It's another puzzle piece to give the big picture of whether this is consistent with Alzheimer's disease. 
a lot of studies are looking at a brain healthy lifestyle, which I'm going to wrap up by talking about. Um, that's your blueberries, salmon, uh, dark chocolate, um, and other things. But we know that if you really adhere to a brain healthy lifestyle, it may reduce your risk over time by about 30%. Um, people who are involved in six or more activities per month had a 38% lower rate of dementia in one study. Again, that's part of a healthy a brain healthy lifestyle. Um, controlling blood pressure can reduce your risk of dementia. One study showed that people who were able to keep their systolic blood pressure below 140 and then below 120 had significantly fewer diagnoses of mild cognitive impairment and dementia over time. So blood pressure control aggressively is important. And finally, this is really interesting. One study showed a direct correlation between people with poor oral hygiene and the type of bacteria that grew in their mouth to the amount of amyloid protein in their brain. Pretty crazy study, but when you think about it, I mean, your mouth, your oral cavity and your brain are, you know, a few centimeters apart from one another. And so there's no question that, you know, people who are not taking good care of their mouth um, and are getting abnormal bad bacteria in their mouth, there's somehow that's causing increased amyloid in their brain. So uh, I guess I'd say brush, floss your teeth uh, is as good for your brain as everything else that you can do. Uh, so let's, let's wrap up by talking about some a brain healthy lifestyle and then um, we'll finish. Moderate exercise is important. It improves blood flow to your brain. Your brain releases neural growth factors. That makes all those connections I talked about. Everyone should do some sort of moderate exercise most days a week. You don't have to become a triathlete or whatnot. You, whether even if you're more limited, whether it's chair yoga or something like that, important to be physically active. Next click. Um, the best diet is something called the MIND diet. It's a combination of a Mediterranean and a heart healthy diet. You look up MIND diet and it's basically a great diet. It's, it's lots of fruits and vegetables, fish, olive oil, de-emphasize you know, processed foods, high sugar foods, um, a glass of wine or spirit, one. Yay big is okay every day. Next click. Um, keep your brain stimulated doing things you like to do. Volunteer work, adult education, listen to a lecture with Dr. Gronin, do puzzles and games, do things you like so you keep on doing them, but do different things to kind of cross train your brain. Uh, and Denise, thank you for your comment on the presentation. Um, soothe your brain, get enough sleep, adequate hydration, whether you meditation, yoga, prayer, whatever helps soothe and calm you is important and see your doctor regularly. We talked about the importance of oral hygiene, of blood pressure control, glucose control, very, very important. And uh, next slide, final slide, have a positive view of aging. We know from a lot of studies, including the work of Becca Levy, a Yale psychologist, that if you believe that you're, you have strength and, and uh, you're capable, you tend to have better strength to be more capable. In fact, people with more positive views of aging, their health was better. They had a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease, on average lived seven years longer. On the flip side, people had poor health, poorer function, shorter lives with more negative views. So it really makes a difference. And one part of this, the final slide, is um, uh, having a sense of purpose. There's been a lot of research looking to people who have purpose, have fewer heart attacks, fewer strokes, they live longer, they feel better. So not that you have to be like uh, Yuchiro Mura and climb on Everest at, at 80, but everyone has their own metaphoric um, uh, Mount Everest they can climb and do something for us. So it makes a difference. Um, next slide. If you want to read more, I my two books, How We Age and the End of Old Age, talk about a positive view of aging, the strengths of aging. And if you are a caregiver for someone, I have a book that dementia caregiver, kind of A to Z. Just go to Amazon, type in Mark Agron, and all these books will, will pop up. And uh, I think that's it. Next slide is just questions and discussions. Um, anyone want to type anything in or ask any questions before we finish? But again, uh, if we can be of any help at Mind Institute at Miami Jewish Health, um, Google us, look us up, call us 305-514-8710. If you're interested in anything about this new treatment, about research studies, reach out. I'll personally be happy to talk to you. And um, you know, we want to be helpful. And again, I want to say thank you so much to the FIU staff for sponsoring this. And hopefully we can do something like this again soon. Thank you, Dr. Gronin.
on uh, behalf of FIU, Human Resources, Office of Employee Assistance, um, College of Nursing, and Panthers Active Wellness Services. We couldn't be more thrilled uh, with your presentation and the information you presented. It was such a, a very wonderfully presented um, subject matter. It, you know, it, it, it crossed over from being very, uh, from having that medical inclusiveness to being you know, easy to understand. So thank you so much for you. your presentation. Um, and I, I would just like to say, you, you definitely have a, a radio voice. So that was also nice to listen to. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're most welcome. Um, so yes, we are so happy that we were able to present with Dr. Ronan today. If you have any questions or thoughts or comments later on, you can always email us at oea.edu. Um, or pause wellness at fiu.edu. Again, that's OEA at fiu.edu and pause wellness at fiu.edu. Um, again, if you need any resources and anything in relation to Alzheimer's disease, please make sure to check out the Miami Juice Health in uh, Mind Institute, Alzheimer's Association, um, FIU Health, FIU Assistance and Wellness, and then also the Centers uh, and the Alliance for Aging. You can always check out information there. And if you need any more information, whether it's on the MIND diet, um, the other good ones too are the Mediterranean diet, uh, the DASH diet, which was a, those are combined in the MIND diet. You can email us or check out their respective sources on Google, since that's the source for all anymore. Um, <laughs> so we want to thank you again. Um, and again, email us if you have any questions or needs for any of the resources and check out Dr. Gronin's books on Amazon. So thank you.